Well, welcome everyone to Wellspring Church. My name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here. I am so glad that you guys are here this morning. I am normally the guy that's doing music. Um, Cameron did an amazing job this morning, by the way. Well, as we begin, I want to talk about a story that you may or may not be familiar with. Has anyone heard of uh, a man named Eric Little? Eric was a missionary kid. He was born into a small family that was serving in China with little to call his own. His older, his older brother Robert and his parents, they lived in a small, dusty community off the beaten path in central China. When he was old enough to attend school, his parents took he and his brother back to their homeland in Scotland. And as he grew, he quickly discovered that he had a bit of an athletic knack, especially when it came to running. By the time he was in college, he started to pick up recognition for his style, his ability to run quickly, and his commitment to following Jesus. But he had this rule about running. He would never run on Sundays. Well, the British Olympic Committee, even people from the Royal Crown, pleaded with him to change his mind, but he refused to do so, citing that Sunday was the Lord's Day, and he wanted to honor that. In the fall of 1923, he was invited to audition for the Summer Olympics of 1924. The only catch was that the, the trials and the race actually were going to take place on Sundays. Now, he, he had a decision to make, so he prayed about it, and he felt like he wasn't supposed to do that. So he actually trained for a completely different race. Instead of planning on running for the 100 meter like he was good at, he, ran, he trained for a long distance race. And he actually did well enough in training for the 400 that he qualified for the Olympics. If any of you have watched the movie Chariots of Fire from the 1980s, you know how the story ends. He did well enough to qualify for the Olympics, and by the time the, the event came around, he ran an unlikely race. He actually won the gold medal for the Olympics. He set an Olympic world record as the fastest runner ever in that race, and he beat the next closest competitor by five full meters. That's amazing that he was able to keep going. Now, you would think that one that was in his shoes would celebrate or take the path of fame and fortune. That's actually what several other Olympians did that were in his very shoes, including the, the man that won the 100 meter that year. Eric Lytle, however, chose a different path. Instead of, at the height of success, instead of fitting into the mold and letting others define his success, Little chose to return to his roots. After winning the gold medal, he stunned those around him by announcing that he intended to become a missionary to China to teach math and science. Well, Little knew something that we often struggle to know. Little knew something about his identity, about what he counted on to define him, that we often don't. He refused to let others define him and wouldn't let the achievements of his past define him. He wouldn't let the promise of fame and fortune define him. He knew that there was something more, something deeper that was out there. And so he chose to let his faith in Jesus define him and define his identity, therefore his future. This morning, as we continue our series exploring how God's love is greater, we'll look at a passage of Scripture that talks about the struggle that comes when we seek our identity from anything other than God and His grace. Paul makes a bold claim in Romans 7 that by arguing that our past doesn't have to define us. Our struggles don't define us. Even our successes don't define us. If we're followers of Jesus, it's the grace of God that's the only thing that defines us. Much like little, I believe that we, true can, or we too can find out what truly defines our present and our future beyond whatever this world may offer or not offer us. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 7. That's where we'll begin our time this morning. We'll spend most of our time there, but before we dive in the passage, I want to take a couple of minutes and talk about some background information behind the text. Because it's helpful for us as we look at this passage to understand a little bit about what's going on, because he has a little bit of legal jargon that's in there. Paul wrote the entire book of Romans as a letter to followers of Jesus that lived in the city of Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire at the time. Now, he'd heard of this budding church there. He'd never actually visited that community. When Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, the church had already been meeting for about 10 years, and most of, of those that were gathering together, most of the followers of Jesus there, had actually converted from Judaism. Now, to most of us in this room, that really 
doesn't mean a whole lot. But to a Jew living in antiquity, to decide to follow Jesus as their Messiah actually was a pretty big deal. The Jews, after all, lived in a rule-driven society. Their religious beliefs and their practices were bound up in rules, along with politics, social order, and everything else, causing an overabundance of laws that were confusing and incredibly difficult to follow. Certainly, the average person that followed Judaism wouldn't have fully understood how to navigate the finer intricacies of Jewish law. Pharisees, the Jewish experts, so devoted their entire lives to following the law and making sure that they didn't break any single commandment that they even called, uh, they created what they called the fence around the Torah. An additional 600 rules or so that they built just to make sure that they wouldn't break any single law from the Old Testament. You might say that following the rules was a big deal to Jewish people. Add one more layer into the mix. They were also in Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. And the Romans, they controlled their entire civilization based on rules. They had a caste system that they enforced strictly and had little tolerance for rule breakers. Those who stepped outside the lines of Roman rule were either forced into slave labor or worse. They were, they were given a slow and torturous death through capital punishment. The Romans owned and controlled the law of the land. And so this rules upon rules upon rules context is, is the background in which Paul is writing this letter to Romans. People who, who desperately believe in Jesus would have received this message. They wanted to follow God as best they could, but there still was this, this definition of following God based in rules that was around them. And so they struggled to understand what the gospel meant in the midst of all of it. So Paul starts off his passage in Romans 7 by talking about the law. And he uses a style of argument that most of us probably aren't familiar with, but people would have been familiar with back in their day. Uh, it's a style that actually, it's a little bit of a circular argument, like, like people climbing a, a winding staircase. As you go up, you define it a little bit more. If you hold up a gem and look at it from different facets, each time you look at it in a different angle, you understand it a little bit more. He also uses a heavy personal emphasis, referencing I or me in the passage, because he too comes from this, this same background, both with a background as a Jew and, and a Roman citizen living in the Roman world. So let's start off by reading in Romans 7, 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. For I know that good itself doesn't dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the thing, the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. Let's focus here on the end of the passage because this is where I really believe some nuggets start to come out. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law at work within me. As we read this passage, what we can notice right away is tension. Paul's back and forth language between what he wants to do, his intentions, and then his actions reveal his internal battle, this, this waging war, as he calls it, between his mind and his heart. Paul's entire focus is on trying to do the right thing, trying to follow the law correctly, to follow all the rules, but he's defining himself and his identity and his relationship with God based on the rules. But the outcome is tension. It's inner warfare. It's not joy, hope, or peace. So what defines Paul's struggle? Paul states that he's observed another law at work within himself. I love how the New Living Translation translates it. They actually call it another principle of life. Paul wants to be a good person, he wants to live right. He wants to do the right things and follow Jewish law. But evil, he states, is right there with him. To put it another way, Paul loves God. He loves God's law and he wants to do what God wants him to do with his whole heart. But this focus on following the rules brings about another force that's within him, wreaking havoc in his mind. But what is this force? What is this, this evil that Paul talks about? Paul actually calls it our sinful nature, our sin nature. And it's something that's inside of all of us. It rises up any time rules or boundaries are placed on us. 
Whether we feel threatened and trapped by rules or, or we simply don't have it within us to follow everything perfectly, the sin nature shows up frequently. It's just a reality of what it means to be a human. Paul argues that his sin nature wages war within his mind and his soul and captures him as a victim of this struggle. Well, how does that work? Let's take a look at a couple verses in the text again. Verse 15 says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And then further on in verse 21, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Now notice Paul's focus here. His attention, it's on the law, on following the law. When his focus, his delight is on his own ability to do what the law is telling him to do, that's when sin rises in him. And you see, whenever our focus is on religious rules, Whenever we put our sense of security, our right standing, our identity in what we do, we stand on a wobbly platform, feeling this tension between our good intentions and our insufficient actions. We'll always be caught prisoner, wondering if we're good enough, if we've done enough, or if we've measured up. But with that, every time comes grief, shame, and condemnation. Because after all, that, that is what sin is. It, sin is about what we do. But God is about who we are. He wants to, us to define ourselves by him, not by our own ability to measure up. I actually love how John Maxwell puts it in the Leadership Bible. He says that Paul mentions several things that are a part of what we can all identify with as humans in struggling with sin. He says that we feel trapped, confused, eager to do what's good, unable to follow through in an inward war that leaves us full of tension and frustration. It's so true, though. In our own efforts to do what's right, we fall into so many pitfalls that cause us to not measure up or feel incredibly beat down. But that's the nature of sin. Guilt, shame, inadequacy, and not measuring up, they all go hand in hand with this struggle with sin. The weight is so heavy that we might find ourselves, as Paul asked at one point, what a wretched man that I am, who can free me from this burden of sin and death? Several years ago, I had the opportunity to mentor some 300 college freshmen on campus at Baylor University when I served as a chaplain for a dorm building there. I had the opportunity to, to build healthy relationships and great relationships with some amazing young men that today are world changers, leading missionary groups and different things all around the globe. It was a fun time. But I can remember a series of conversations I had with one young man, a man named Red, Red was such a likable guy. Everybody in the dorm building loved him. He was a very talented guy. He played guitar. He sang. He was involved in the worship team at his church. He also um, got heavily involved in the dorm. He excelled academically. Everyone around him really loved him and cared about him. So as often as I could, I invited him to leadership conversations as a dorm chaplain. And every time I had that conversation, he'd just shy away. He, he didn't want to do it. Well, after his first semester... I noticed that he actually started to back out of more and more things. He actually stopped playing in the worship team at the church that he was involved in. He stopped going to the Bible study that he was a part of. He even stopped attending some of the, the groups that we did in the dorm building. And so I, I thought something was up. I didn't know if it was just the, the weight of the, the middle of the semester or if there was something more brewing. But I looked for an opportunity to talk to him. Then the opportunity came. I was literally just walking through the hallways one afternoon, and I saw he was in his room doing some homework. And so I asked, hey, are, are you okay? Can we talk for a couple of minutes? He gladly said yes. He actually walked in. He closed the door to his building. He took a deep breath like I just did. Then looked down on the ground. He wouldn't even look me in the eyes. His eyes got really puffy. And he started to explain that, that he had this struggle welling within him. He didn't feel good enough. He felt incredibly guilty. He felt like the weight of the world was on his shoulders. He didn't feel like he could measure up or do enough to earn God's love. He described that he'd, he'd fallen headfirst into an internet addiction with pornography. And he didn't know what to do. He was trapped by sin and couldn't escape it. And he felt like there was no way out on his own. He was literally living out what Paul talks about here in Romans chapter 7. He felt trapped, confused, wanting to do what's right, unable to follow through, deep inside this inner war and full of frustration over the tension. So he and I actually picked up the Bible together. We read this chapter together and 
we discovered a couple of things. First, we discovered that everyone fights the sin nature, and then the downcast struggle, this guilt, this shame, this condemnation that comes with it. Everyone feels like they can't measure up. Asking like Paul did in verse 24, who can free us from this body that's subject to death? Luckily, he has an answer for my friend Red and answer for you and me as well. So let's go ahead and read 725 through 82. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature am a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. I love this. God doesn't leave us in the middle of the struggle. God's love is greater because we're given a person, not rules to follow. A person who loves us with a love that far surpasses the rules. A love that is greater than the inner war we face. It's full of grace, hope, and redemption. A love that redefines us. So Paul begins this next section with an incredibly profound statement. And as he does so, he shifts the focus of his whole argument He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. I actually love his choice of original language because the word he uses for thanks could equally, and I argue probably should equally be translated as the word grace. We might even read it as, who can save us? The grace of God through Jesus Christ. The grace of God is what delivers us through Jesus. It does the work. It does defines us. Our past might be full of Olympic gold medals like Eric Little, or it might be marred with some serious struggle of sin, pursuing the law and an incredible sense of despair like my friend read. But no matter what, Jesus died on the cross. God's grace offers a new sense of identity for those of us who want to follow Jesus. And it's no longer dependent on us. It's dependent on what he did. So what does that mean for us? What are the implications of all of that for us? And what does define us? I believe there's a few things that the text stands out that says what does define us. First, God's grace defines us. Not the struggles we walk through. It's God's grace that defines us. Notice how in the passage it states that God's grace is present in the middle of any and every struggle. No matter how deep or how dark that rabbit hole might go, God's love is greater still. No matter how hopeless you might feel or how trapped you might feel like you carry the weight of the world on your shoulders, God's love is greater and God's grace is right there. After all, Paul reminds us that at the apex of his struggle, when he threw his hands in the air in hopelessness, it was the grace of God through Jesus' work on the cross that delivers us. Grace is God's work. It literally means unmerited favor, but I love in the original language it actually has a double meaning. Not only does it mean this gift of God that God has for us, but it also means the sense of God literally extending himself, reaching his hand out, pulling out with everything he has to give us something new. And so God's grace is both this gift and an act where he's actively pursuing us to give us new life and give us a new identity to redefine our lives. And thanks to God's grace, Paul writes, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God's grace offers us a new identity, a new hope, and a new future. Second, God's work defines us, not our own work. A second implication that's worth noting, it comes from Paul's original use of language. 25 times throughout Romans 7, Paul uses the words I or me, culminating with his grand question in 724. Who can rescue me from this body that is subject to death? It's almost like Paul is trying to overemphasize how much he was trying to do things on his own. How in trying to follow the law and obey it, he was fighting sin in his own strength. And it was too much for him to carry alone. The Old Testament law only served to point out in abundance that he wasn't good enough. That he really couldn't do it on his own. Well, Paul intentionally shifts his language from describing the inner war to describing God's inner work resulting in freedom. Instead of using the pronouns like I or me, he starts talking about God's action to deliver him and deliver you and deliver me. Because the action Jesus did on the cross, there is no condemnation 
according to Romans 8, 1. Because who we are isn't based any longer on what we do or what we don't do. Jesus gives us a new law and a new principle to follow through the Spirit, according to 8, 2. And in God's Spirit gives us life and sets us free. We are now defined by God's work as we follow Jesus, not our own. A third implication is God's identity for us defines us, not how we see ourselves. Early in Romans 7, Paul identifies himself as one in the midst of struggling. Yet when Paul shifts the conversation from his own efforts to God's gracious activity that offers freedom, a new identity comes. Paul is no longer a wretched man like he claims in 724. Instead, he's a man without condemnation, a man free of shame. The deliverer has brought him freedom. He has a a new sense of purpose that comes from Jesus. Jesus redefined Paul. Several years ago, I met a woman whose life was transformed, who really understood the implications of what it meant to have a new identity in Jesus. Susan was a victim. She had every right to be enraged. Her 22-year-old son that was a recent college grad that had, uh, had an amazing job offer and a bright future, he was murdered. One evening, the San Antonio Police Department came knocking on her door early in the morning with bad news. Her son had come out of a movie late. He stopped to get gas, was approached by a thug wanting to rob him, and instead murdered him. When Susan first got the news, she was consumed by anger. All she wanted was justice, even revenge. But God nudged her. And it came through the Lord's Prayer, of all things. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. As those words hit her, she knew it. The Lord wanted her to forgive this man. She didn't want to do it. But the grace of God was greater. God's love is greater. She was a forgiver. That was her new identity in Jesus. So forgive is what she had to do. Now, Texas has an interesting twist in their laws for for those who have been in Texas or or know about Texas. When it comes specifically about murder trials uh, of convicted criminals, parents or or closest of kin, they have the opportunity to face individuals convicted of murdering the ones they love. Well, this mother actually took that opportunity in court to speak on behalf of the family. So the time came and, and Susan went up in the front of the courtroom. She had a speech that she'd prepared from before the beginning of, uh, of the trial. And as she got up there, she took that letter and she literally just ripped it in half. And then with tears in her eyes, she looked at the criminal in the eyes and said, I forgive you. She told this man that God had loved her so much and God's love had gripped her so much to free her from the agony of anger and victimization because God had forgiven her. So she had no choice but to forgive him. And this man could know that love of God in the same way that she knew it. As you could probably imagine, you could hear a pin drop in the courtroom in that moment. That man was shocked. The judge and the jury were shocked as well. How could God's love be so profound? It was 15 years ago that I heard this woman speak. Now, I don't know if if this murderer is still alive today or if he was killed on death row, but I do know that this man was so impacted by Susan's words that he went into his jail cell that night and he prayed. He asked God to help him to know that same love that that woman knew. He wanted wanted to know her God. I believe we all do. The truth is that God's love is greater. It's greater than any sin struggle we might face. It's greater than sin and an inclination to sin. It's greater than an identity that comes from sin. God's love actually gives us a new identity, not an identity with condemnation. It's one without anxiety, one not tied to the sin struggle, but instead it's tied to God's grace and the work that Jesus did on the cross. We're now slaves to his work on the cross, not to our old patterns of sin. These are some incredibly deep truths that we've looked at this morning. And the implications of God's love being greater than any internal struggle we might go through are huge. God's grace saves us through the work of Jesus on the cross, not our own work. And the application to what we do with this, I believe, are equally ground-shaking 
So how should we apply this to our lives? I believe that God would challenge us in three areas this morning. And the first area that I believe God wants to challenge us is this, to rest. To rest. To work on being still and resting in God's grace and love. Not to work on doing. Now this one is probably the hardest for most of us after all. Most of us like to do, like to fix things, like to work on our own. And our own sin nature teaches us that that we have to work and earn our salvation. But I love how Paul explains this a little bit more in Titus 2.12. Paul says, starting in, verse, in Titus 2, starting in verse 11, the grace of God has appeared to all that offers salvation to all people. It, this grace of God, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright lives in this present age. God's grace does the work for us. It teaches us to have good lives. It's not something that we have to do on our own. Several years ago, I was reminded of this important truth. My wife and I were were both married in graduate school, and we didn't have a lot of money. When I graduated and we moved to Phoenix, we both started working to save as much money as possible. We worked hard, and we saved harder. But when Ginger got pregnant with our oldest daughter, Addie, we both felt like staying at home so she could take care of the kids was what the Lord wanted her to do. Now, I'm a planner. I I like to make sure every penny is accounted for and everything works out in our budget. But I I wasn't confident that we could make it work this time. I actually couldn't get the numbers to add up on paper. In the midst of this, in the midst of all of our struggling, we still felt like we were supposed to surrender it to God. So we did. We chose to follow God's leading. What he told us to spend, we would spend. What he told us to give away, we'd give away. And what he told us to save, we'd save. And we did our best to rest in God's grace in that season. Needless to say, Addie came and month one came and went. There was still money in the bank. Then the second month came and there was still money in the bank. And by the third month, we finally started to catch on that maybe God was doing something here. That God was actually providing for us. Even if it didn't make sense on paper, our money was actually stretching further than what we'd anticipated because God did the work on our behalf. It wasn't something that we could do or manufacture. Now, three kids later, God's grace is still providing for us. The truth is that God's grace will provide for all of us. God's grace will deliver us and cover over our imperfections every single time. We choose to follow him and his spirits and lean into his prompting. God's grace will teach us how to live and guide us. All we have to do is choose to rest in him and walk with him. The second challenge that I believe God has for us this morning is to reflect on the truth of the gospel, to reflect on Jesus and the cross, to reflect on the depth of God's love and the grace demonstrated through the one who delivers us, Jesus our Lord. I love how Paul wrote about two extremes in Romans 7, Uh, 24 and 25. He he both wrote about the sense of hopelessness that came from his own work and his own despair, and then a a new sense of purpose that stemmed from God's grace and God's work. He said, what a wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me from this body of sin and death? The grace of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. As we take time to slow down and reflect on what it means for us, how God's grace literally delivers us from sin and shame and condemnation, giving us a new sense of hope and purpose, It can change our perspective and change the entire course of our lives. The difference here is that God's work is already done. God already defeated uh, death and sin through the cross. As we choose to identify with Jesus, condemnation has no place for those who are in Jesus. The old nature that has already been covered over by the work that Jesus did on the cross. Well, back to to my story uh, with my friend Red. As he and I read the passage from Romans 7 together and prayed together, we began to see how God had a plan for him. He could see from this passage and a few others that that we looked at that God had already defeated sin through the cross. While his mind and his flesh had been feeling incredibly guilt-ridden, full of shame and despair, let down by this hopeless self-pursuit, the promise from Scripture that there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus gave him a new sense of hope. If God had defeated every sin, including his, 
he could find freedom. He could let go of that guilt that he'd allowed to define him and instead allow the entire trajectory of his life to have a new focus because of what Jesus did on the cross. God wants us to all have that same new identity to define our future. If we reflect on the grace that God gives us and how he gives us freedom, it will do just that. Finally, I believe that God wants us to retell the story, to retell his story, to point people to our deliverer. God's love was greater through God's grace as Jesus acted to deliver us, saving us from condemnation and offering us new life. If you found grace in Jesus, tell someone about that. It doesn't have to be difficult or complex. You don't have to have this churchy, super spiritual conversation with someone. It it literally can be something that you have as you're going about your normal daily routine, whether it's Starbucks or the grocery store. That's actually why we've been sharing these My Story videos over the course of this series. We'll see another one in a few moments when we receive the offering. Um, But you'll notice one thing about every single story. No one, to my knowledge, in the videos has a theology degree. And the truth is that you don't need a theology degree either to share your story. There are opportunities for us to share the love that we found in Jesus and the grace that we found through Jesus all the time as we do what we normally do. I love the hope that Paul gives us in Romans chapter 7. God's grace walks with us in our greatest triumphs and in the middle of our deepest, darkest hours. When we feel like all is lost, and we can't do things on our own. God's grace delivers us through the work of Jesus on the cross. And his work is already done. God's grace gives us a new identity as we walk with him and let him fight our battles for us. I believe that as we really grasp that love, grace, and new identity that Paul is talking about, our inner world will be changed. The world of those around us will be changed. And who knows, maybe God will even move the the focus of our life on a different trajectory entirely because of this grace of God. And so my question this morning for us is, what will we do with God's grace? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your love and, and your grace. I thank you so much for the work that you did on the cross that literally gives us new life, that gives us a new identity and a new sense of purpose. I I pray this morning that you would cover over us. As we're praying, as we're we're bowing our heads, I I believe there are some that as we talked about this, this grace of God, that you're saying, man, I love that grace of God, but I want that for my life, like, like the prisoner did on death row, but I don't even know what that is. I need that in my life. And if that's you, all you have to do is, is ABC, admit that you need Jesus in your life. Believe in him. Believe that he died on the cross to cover over your sins and commit your life to following him. And so if that's you right now, just while we're quietly praying, I challenge you, look up at me. Just make eye contact with me where you're at. I believe there's also a couple other people that are in the room that, that as, um, as we talked about God's grace, you just, you're saying, man, I could use a breath of fresh air. I could use a fresh touch from God. I, I just, I've been walking through a struggle and I need this reminder. And so, so please pray with me and pray for me. If that's you, I want to ask you to raise your hand and I want to pray over you and pray that God's grace would cover over you and walk over everything that you may be going through. God, I I thank you so much for your grace. I thank you, Lord, that that the, the promise of Scripture, that our identity, our hope, doesn't come from the things that we do, but from the work that you've already done on the cross. Lord, may you strengthen us. May you encourage us. May you remind us that your grace is enough. May you allow your grace to walk with us in the middle of the struggle. May we feel your presence in new and fresh ways. God, we need you. And so I pray that you would come, breathe new life in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.